This morning, we're in our series from the book of James. We've, we've, we're in chapter 1, and we're getting today down to James chapter 1, verse 13. And James begins to talk to us in this passage of Scripture about the subject of temptation. Now, I grew up in church all of my life. My father, most of my life, was a bivocational pastor, which meant we were always small churches. I, I thought that if I ever really got saved and got in the right place, I would never have to worry with another temptation. Because all these older folks that I saw at church, man, I was certain that they never were tempted. They were perfect. And I was real cognizant of the fact that I wasn't. I was more like Gilbert. So, love to have somebody to pick on Gilbert. You're a good man. That way I don't pick on Gilberto so much, okay? <laughs> what I discovered was, I'm now 68 years of age, and I've discovered there's still some temptations that come along. Regardless of how many times you go to church, how much you read your Bible, and how many times you pray. So let's dive in a moment in this subject here. James chapter 1, verse 13, 14, and 15 is what we're going to look at first. Here's what he says. Remember, when you are being tempted, you understand he didn't say if. When. When you are being tempted. In other words, it seems like James is expecting that as a followers of Christ, you're going to have times of temptation. You could say amen or oh me or help. You know, somewhere in there. He said, do not say God is tempting me. Don't say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. God does not tempt me to do wrong. Temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. We're going to talk about that phrase in a few moments. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to what? Death. That's what we're wanting to avoid. We're wanting to avoid the death. Now, in the Bible, we'll talk about it in a few moments, but in the Bible, the word death means separation. There are two kinds of death. There's physical death and there's spiritual death. Spiritual death is when I'm separated from God. When sin gets into my life, there becomes a barrier between me and God. That barrier is removed by the blood of Jesus Christ, by confession and repentance. But there's still a barrier that comes anytime that I sin, I, I lose connection with God. That's spiritual death, but there's also physical death. And, and that's when my body separates from the real me, which is a spirit and soul. The real me looks a lot better than the guy standing up here. This is just my temporary house. Work out all you want to, diet all you want to, take all the pills and vitamins you want to. The body is eventually going to die. One out of one human beings on earth are going to die. Right? We're all headed there. So this is temporary. The body is going to separate from my spirit and my soul. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. Here we go. First off, on your outlines this morning, on your notes here, quick basics on temptation. This is just to get us started. Number one, temptation is not sin. Everybody say sin. sin. So when temptation comes into your life, that doesn't mean you're sinning. It means you're human. Okay? Temptation is not sin. Number two, you ready, guys? Temptation is not from God. That's what James tells you. Just want to get that in there. Don't go like, oh, God's tempting me. No, God's not tempting you. It's not where it comes from. Number three, temptation is for everyone. Everybody, say everyone. Everyone. The Bible even warns us that if you think you're beyond temptation, you're the most dangerous position to fall. Paul said, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. So if you think, well, man, I've been reading my Bible, I've been praying, I've been going to church, I'm really good. God's lucky to have me. <laughs> Dude, you just got a problem with pride. How you doing? You know, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he falls. 
So if you think, man, I'm never going to do that, you look at somebody else, they messed up, and you're going to, well, praise God, I would never do that. Ooh, watch out. You may not do that one, but Satan knows what you will do. So that's the basics, okay? So let's talk about three things, the source of temptation, the steps of temptation, and the solution for temptation. Everybody say solution. That's what we want to get to. That's the good news. First off, let's talk about the source of temptation. It's real clear. It's in our scripture. It's your own desires. It's your own desires. Here's what happens. If you study that out in the Greek, which is the original language that that was written in, your own desires actually means your unique desires. Every one of us are unique human beings, right? We have unique fingerprints. We have unique whatever that thing is in my eyes that they can read. You know, that says is even whatever it is. Uh, we're unique. We're unique personalities. You can raise three kids in your home, and every one of them are different. You think with the first one you got it figured out, and then comes the second one. And you're going like, where did they come from? And your mom says, you're paying for your raising. That's the way you were. Right? We have a new love for our parents when our kids get teenagers. Wow, okay, anyway, uh, we're all unique. So guess what? Your unique desires become Satan's doorway to bring temptation to you. And what is Satan's door for you may not bother me at all. Hello? And that's what it's talking about here, is that Satan appeals to our own desires. And those desires aren't necessarily evil. It's just that Satan tries to meet that legitimate desire in a bad way. That's what we'll talk about here in a moment. So you need to understand that this is the combination of Satan working with my flesh to attract me to do something that's not right to do. That's where, that's where they come from, okay? Let's talk about the steps of temptation, and, and I'm going to try... You, you may want to pray for a gift of interpretation when I write on boards, but in order to get this in our head, I'm going to try to draw a, a little chart, and uh, I think you've got enough room there on the side of your notes to draw this. It's not real complicated. That's why I'm going to try this. So I, I hope you all can all see this, and maybe with the help of the cameras, you can get this, okay? So we're going to start out with this big square, and then inside the square... We're going to draw a circle. We're, we're, we're doing artwork with real basic stuff here. And inside the circle, we're going to draw a triangle. Now, you don't realize it, but that's really you. It really is. Here's what that is. We are made in the image of God. God is a tripartite being. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. When God created you, when God created me, he created us as three-part beings. The first part of me, which is the part of me that you see this today, is my body. That's the black part. That's the square. That's the house that I live in. It's a temporary house. It's going to last 70, 80, 90 years, maybe 100 years if we hang around that long. Okay? Now, on the inside of me is my soul, S-O-U-L. My soul is actually made up of three parts as well. My soul has a mind, a will, and emotions. So I have my body and I have my soul, which is my mind, my will, and my emotions. Then I have my spirit, which is the real me. Because I'm made in the image of God. God is a spirit, and those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. So, the real me is a spirit. I possess a soul, and I live in a body. Everybody tracking with me so far? Okay, now here is what I know about those three parts of my existence. My body is always attracted to Satan, sin, and the world. The body wants whatever feels good now. The body doesn't like to wait for anything. 
The body doesn't like deferred gratification. The body is like a two-year-old child sitting at the dinner table asking for the mashed potatoes and they've got company over and mom's trying to impress the company says now Johnny what's the magic word and Johnny goes he thinks a moment he goes pass me the mashed potatoes now <laughs> right it's like we want it right now if it feels good do it it can't be wrong because it feels so right that's a lie okay so the body is always going for Satan's sin in the world. My spirit, the real me, is always going after God and good. Because the real me is made in the image of God. The real me is, I love you, Lord, and I worship you. The real me loves it when we get in a worship service and we're worshiping God and we feel the presence of God. So my spirit is going after God. My body is going after let's party and so every day thousands of times a day there's a committee meeting between my spirit my body and my soul and there's a vote taken and the vote is always two to one y'all doing okay out there votes always two to one and right here in the very center is the deciding vote my mind, my will, my emotions make the vote whether I'm going this way or this way. It always goes that way. That's why when Paul talks about don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, your soul. Did you know the Bible never says be renewed by your body? Because your body's temporary. It's like, it's a uh, great illustration. There's, a, there's an old Indian proverb of a little boy who gets in trouble. He did something bad. He got disciplined by mom and dad. And smart little boy, he goes to grandpa. Because grandpa's going to love you regardless of what you do. And he goes to grandpa and he sits down and grandpa says, what's, son, what's wrong, boy? And he says, oh, Grandpa, I did something bad. Well, why'd you do something bad? He says, well, Grandpa, there, there just feels like there's these two dogs on the inside of me. There's a good dog and there's a bad dog. And, and I think I'd, I'd listen to the bad dog. <laughs> and Grandpa says, well, son, do you know how to make sure the good dog wins? And the little boy says, no, Grandpa, how can I make sure the good dog wins? Great line. Are you ready? Whichever dog you feed is the dog that will win the fight. Woo! Come on now. Some of you wondering why you keep doing the stuff you've been doing. Real simple. You've been feeding this part of your life the wrong junk we'll get more into that in a moment okay everybody still love me you gotta love me to go to heaven you know okay so now let's look at the steps on your outlines here we go five steps he, he James puts these down I kind of add one because I think it fits into the scenario and you'll understand why number one it starts with desire desire he says Temptation comes after my desires. You see, in, in the text he says, you are, it entices us and drags us away. Entices us and drags us away. The, the mental picture there is of a hunter and of a fisherman. I understand some men went fishing this last week. They went fishing and had wonderful conversation and caught one fish. So obviously Lighthouse Church are not a group of fishermen, okay? Sorry about that, Pastor Jeremy, Fabio, but I heard y'all had a great time, just no fish. So when I was, when I was, when I was a boy, my, on my mother's side, my grandfather had a little farm and had a pond on his farm, and that was where the cows got their food, and he, he put some catfish in there, and when we would come visit, 
Grandpa had an old cane pole. Anybody remember the old cane poles? Not the fancy ones, the rod and reel. Just a cane pole with a string on it and a hook. And you had a bobber. Anybody know what a bobber is? Bobber's a red and white thing. I got three of us that are old enough to remember that. There we go. Thank you. It's this red and white little ball that floats on the water and the string goes through it. And about 12, 18 inches below that, you put the hook with a weight so that the hook goes down. And Grandpa would teach us the first thing to go do when you're fishing, which is what you guys didn't do, was you've got to go get some bait. <laughs> Am I being honest here? That's what you told me this morning. Right? Okay. So Grandpa would teach us how to go over to the rocks and turn over rocks and find us some big juicy worms. Why? Because catfish love worms. I don't understand it. Wouldn't attract me at all. Never did I ever think of looking at one of those worms and go, oh, I'd like a bite of that. But that's what a catfish, you take that worm, and he taught us how to put that worm over the hook. So the catfish couldn't see the hook, all he would see was the worm. And then you would drop that out there in the water, and you'd watch that little bobber on the top of the water, and you'd see the little bobber start to move. And what that would tell you is, there's a fish nibbling at your worm. And the catfish was getting hungry. And before long, you would see that little bobber just kind of dip under the water, and you would yank that pole. And the catfish thought he was getting lunch. He didn't realize he was about to be lunch. <laughs> because he didn't see the hook. He just saw the worm. Because the worm was appealing to his desire. Come on. See, some of us... Satan knows, hey, the way to get to you, let's dangle a chocolate cake in front of you. I'm not going to go any further. We're just, you understand the deal here. Now, from desire, we, second step is deception. Deception. Desire leads us to deception, and that's where Satan covers the hook to deceive you with false information, with false information. Now, at this point, you aren't in sin. At this point, you're just human. But here comes step three, and that is disobedience. Disobedience is when desire and deception lead us to action that is wrong. Even if the desire is right, the deception leads me to disobedience. For instance, getting sleep, that's very important for our bodies. It recharges our bodies. But if we take that to an extreme, we become lazy and that becomes sin. We're adults in the room. Sex. God created sex. Surprise for some of you. It was God's idea. Sex is not a sin. Sex was created by God to be enjoyed between one man and one woman in the covenant of marriage as a protection for the intimacy that would be enjoyed to not only bring forth life, but to cement the relationship between two individuals in a covenant committed relationship. You take it outside of that protection and Satan brings bad information and deceives you to say, oh, it's okay because we're in love. You're 17 years old. You don't know what love even means. But you're smarter than your parents and everyone else. And you're smarter than the Bible. So you're going to do what you want to do, and you don't realize you're biting the hook. Because sin will always take you where you don't want to go, further than you want to go, and leave you there longer than you want to stay. That was pretty good. <laughs> that really was. Now, now see what's happening here? 
these desires, you know what those desires are appealing to? My desire, desires are appealing to my emotions. The desire is trying to appeal to your emotions. What about the deception? The deception is appealing to your intellect. It's messing with your thinking. The disobedience, it's going after your will. Because it, it knows emotions are often the doorway into our soul. So Satan knows he's got to get in there and then he's got to mess up our thinking so that our will makes a decision that's skewed up. Wow. This is pretty good stuff, right? Okay. Now what happens next? Disobedience is followed by denial. Everybody say denial. Dave Wilkerson, years ago, I heard him teach it. It stuck in my heart. I've, I've seen this over and over in my 40 plus years of ministry. My human brain, your human brain, has the ability to rationalize everything, anything we really want to do. You see, I can believe that something's wrong for Pastor Jeremy, but if I do it, I can justify why it's okay for me to do. I'm the exception. Be careful. Your brain can rationalize what you know you wouldn't say was okay for somebody else to do. That's really good stuff. That's really good stuff. So we begin to deny that the hook's in our mouth when everybody around us sees you got a hook. Oh, no, I didn't, man. It's okay for me. No, you're about to get cooked. You're already hooked and you don't even know it. How y'all doing? Okay, and then comes number five, death. Now, if you want to just real quickly here, we go back to Genesis chapter 3, the first time that man ever sinned. You got Adam and Eve, perfect man, perfect woman. They are living in paradise, a perfect location. They are in perfect harmony with God. They have never sinned. They do not have a sin nature. They have a God nature. And into that perfect environment, God gives them access to every animal, to every tree, to every fruit except for one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God says, in the day that you eat from that tree, you'll die. You can't eat from that tree. One, one rule, don't eat from the tree. Hundreds of other trees. There was plenty to enjoy, but guess what? We're human, and if somebody says, oh, you can have anybody but her, guess who you want? Right? So what happens? Eve goes and hangs out by the tree. And Satan, it says, when Eve looked at the tree, Genesis chapter 3, the tree looked good. Satan's never going to tempt you with something that looks trashy. Hello out there. Satan's never going to tempt you with something that you go, ooh, gross. No, Satan's going to tempt you with something that matches your desires. So she looked at the tree and thought, well, that tree looks pretty good. And then here comes deception. Satan comes along and says, hey, didn't God say you can eat from any tree? Well, we can eat from any tree except for the tree, that one tree. Because God said, if we eat of that tree, we'll die. And what does Satan say? No, you won't die. If you eat from that tree, you're going to be like God. What does everybody want to be? Everybody wants to be their own boss. Everybody wants to be God. Everybody wants to make their own rules. What do we live in today? We live in a society today where everybody wants to say, everybody gets their own right and wrong. Don't tell me what's wrong. You live by your rules. I'll live by my rules. Let's all just get along. Guess what, folks? That's not new. That started in Genesis chapter 3. Come on, if you eat from this tree, you'll be like God. Deception. So what happens? Eve disobeys God, eats of the tree. And here's the interesting part of the story. She doesn't just eat herself. She gives some to her husband. Why? Because nobody likes to sin alone. Come on now. 
We want somebody else who's doing the same stuff we're doing so we can feel justified that we're okay because, well, look, Jeremy's doing it. <laughs> Come on. Disobedience. And then God comes down because it's time for their daily chat. They're going to have tea. Maybe with some cookies or chocolate cake. I don't know. God comes down, and guess what? God doesn't see Adam and Eve. And God asks a very interesting question. God says, Adam, where are you? Now, let me ask a question. Did God know where they are? Where they are? Where they were? Yes, he did. God knows all things. So God was not asking the question so he could figure out where they are. You can't hide from God. Oh. Where are you, Adam? What does Adam say? Uh, we're hiding. <laughs> Boy, when your mind gets deceived, you make stupid choices. I'm going to go hide from God. He'll never find me. Really? Let's see how that works for you. But sin makes us want to hide from God. We're hiding. Why are you hiding? We're hiding because we're naked. Who told you you were naked? I love this part. Adam says, that woman you gave me. <laughs> she made me do it. <laughs> Typical human response, isn't it? It's not my fault. My kids, wonderful kids, they just hang out with some of the Pat Deacon's kids. That's what their problem is. My child never did anything wrong. They just hung out with the wrong people. But you know, if they're hanging out with the wrong people all the time, maybe it's because they fit there. Oh, this went over really well. Okay. <laughs> Denial sets in. Adam and Eve are denying. Adam's saying, well, you're... And disobedience comes. They get kicked out of the garden. Death comes. They lose their intimate relationship with God. They're kicked out of the garden. Spiritual separation. And also at that moment in human history is when death first entered the human. They didn't drop dead immediately. But the process of death started in their bodies, which were originally created to live forever. God originally created humankind to live forever. But the wages of sin are death. You okay out there? You understand how that process works. So now we understand the steps. Let's talk about the solution. This is the good part. I'll try to wrap up kind of quick, but it'll take me a moment here. Solution for temptation. Two thoughts. Number one, God's word. Everybody say God's word. We, we're still in James chapter 1. Let's go down to verse 21. James, after talking about temptation, some other things, James says, so get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives. Now understand, James is writing to believers. He's not writing to heathens. He's not writing to people outside the body of Christ. He's writing to the people who have already made Jesus the Lord of their life. And he says to them, get rid of your filth, get rid of your evil, and humbly accept what? The Word. Everybody say Word. Word of God. Accept the Word God has planted in your hearts for it has the power to what? Save your... Oh! Doesn't say the, word, the Bible has power to, change, to save your body. It has power to save your soul. Why? Because God knows this is, this is the control center of your life. It's the Word of God that has the power to save your soul. Jesus said in John chapter 8, you will know the truth... And the truth will do what? Set you free. You will know. Circle the word know there. You will know the truth. My word is truth. So the word of God is truth. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? It's not God's word in my hand, but God's word in my heart that sets me free. That's pretty good. A lot of people think, well, I've got a Bible. Not doing you a lot good on that nightstand, is it? looks good on the coffee table but it's not doing a whole lot of change to your life it's not until you pick it up and you begin to read it and you plant it in your heart and in your head that suddenly freedom 
gets to come. Why? Because it's through the Word of God that we overcome the deception of the enemy. Hello? Let me help you out. The only way to overcome deception is to know the truth. You can't, uh, you can't stop thinking about the temptation Satan is bringing to you. You know what you have to do? You can't resist it. You have to replace it. Because what you resist persists. Illustration, okay? Don't think about pink elephants with yellow dots. Just tell yourself, I'm not going to think about that. And guess what the only thing is you can think about? Pink elephants with yellow dots. But if instead I say, now think about brown cows. You replaced the first thought with the second thought. That's what we do with the Word of God. We replace the deception with the Word of God. I like what David prayed in Psalms 119. Psalms 119, verse 37, David said, Turn my eyes from worthless things and give me life through your word. This is a pretty powerful thought. Wow. I've been, I've been meditating on that verse now for about 10 days. I've been asking God, God, show me what things in my life are worthless that are messing me up here. There's some things that aren't necessarily evil. They're just worthless. Too much time on the video games. Too much time in front of a television or a computer. Too much time shopping or eating chocolate cake. What's your desire that's worthless and not adding to your spirit being? Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with chocolate cake, praise God. Too much of some things are bad, though. You understand what I'm saying here? What, what is there worthless in your life that Satan can use as deception to get you to disobedience. Some of you this morning, before you leave today, need to just say, okay, God, show me in my life the worthless things that I'm spending time on that are opening the door for deception in my life so I can get rid of all of it so that I can be free through your word. And then there's the, the last part here, and that is this. Not only does God give us his word, but God gives us grace. Everybody say grace. All oh, this is powerful. We go back to Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, they've fallen. They've denied God. They're separated from God. And God does an amazing thing. God gives them a promise that someday there's going to come a Redeemer who's going to crush the head of Satan. And then God does something for Adam and Eve. Most of the paintings that you see of Adam and Eve in the garden, they have leaves covering strategic parts of their body, right? But if you go to Genesis chapter 3, they weren't wearing leaves. Because when God came and met with them, the Bible says God made them clothes out of animal skins. You know how God made them clothes out of animal skins? He had to kill the animal. Why did God kill the animal? Because the Bible teaches us in Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. In Genesis chapter 3, when God killed that first animal to make covering for Adam and Eve, it was actually a foreshadowing of the day that God would send his son Jesus into the world to die on a cross to shed his blood so that the sins of you and me and all of humanity could be forgiven. That's called grace. Did Adam and Eve deserve it? No. Do you and I deserve it? No, 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 and double no. But regardless of who you are, where you've been, 
what you've done or where you are today God loves you so much he gave his son Jesus to die on the cross for you and me that's grace here's my definition of grace I believe grace is the desire and the ability to please God I don't have that desire in my flesh my soul's kind of messed up because there's a sin virus going on in here now my spirit wants to please God but this part of me keeps messing up that's why in Romans 7 Paul says I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I do want to do because there's this battle going on here but when God sends grace into my life it changes the way I think the way I feel and the way I make decisions and he gives me the desire to please God and the ability to please God. The desire and the ability are a gift from God. Isn't that awesome? Wow, you guys have endured a lot. Okay, let's bow our heads and let's pray a prayer. Would you just say with me real quickly, God, what are you saying to me? Right now, what's the Holy Spirit trying to say to you? Some of you this morning in your spiritual journey, you would be honest enough to say, Pastor Dearest, I, I got some stuff I need to get rid of. I've been living in disobedience, denial. I want to start the path over and today I want to make Jesus the Lord and I want to ask him to forgive me with our heads bowed eyes closed this is a private moment those of you watching online you can just type there in the chat and you can say today's my day I want to know Jesus as my Lord those of you in the room if you're here today and you say pastor Darius I need forgiveness and I need Jesus to be my Lord. If that's you, would you just raise a hand as if you're reaching up to God to say, here, God, forgive me today. I need forgiveness. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Lord, I pray for friends today who are making that choice. I pray that you will teach them and guide them, that they would be open to what you are saying. In Jesus' name. When you came in this morning, you should have received some elements of communion. We waited till this point of the service because I wanted you to understand why we're doing the communion. It's a symbol of the blood and the body of Jesus. If you did not receive one of the elements when you came in, if you'll raise a hand, the ushers will quickly bring you one. So ushers, if you'll help me, there's a few folks with their hands up. We practice here at Lighthouse an open communion. It's not a requirement that you be a member of the church in order to receive communion. If you have committed your life as a follower of Jesus Christ, we invite you to celebrate communion with us. We believe that the elements of communion are actually a symbol of the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, since COVID, we had to go to individually sealed communion elements, which means they're not the most tasty. And I have people sometimes that say, well, man, that, that wafer is really kind of bland. And I was talking about that the other day in staff, and I says, you know, guys, Maybe it's not such a bad idea to help us remember how really horrible that sacrifice was. Maybe we shouldn't take this as if something that tastes good, but we should recognize the bitterness of the sacrifice that Jesus gave for us. In a moment, we're going to take together this little wafer as a sign, a symbol, a reminder 
of Jesus' sacrifice, his body being broken and beaten, and his blood being poured out so that you and I could have life today. That's grace. So, Father God, we pause this morning. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, God, that you loved us so much that you gave your son Jesus to die on the cross so that whoever believes in him should not perish but could have everlasting life. God, I pray this morning that your life would flow through the body of the lighthouse today. Lord, I pray for those today who may be struggling in areas of their life that even as they partake of this wafer and of this juice, they would be reminded that greater is he that's within us than he that's in the world. I receive that this morning. May you bless these elements as your grace is released within us new and fresh. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we partake together of the bread? take together of the cup. Thank you, Jesus. Would you stand with me this morning and let's sing together. What can wash away our sin? What can you join me and let's just give him thanks for that this morning thank you god thank you for your blood